Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Annie. As it was mentioned, my name is France Gelina, and I'm the MPP for Nickel Belt, which is in northeastern Ontario. <laughs> there's, there's a few people from the north here. <laughs> and I'm also the health critic for my party, the NDP. I have been the health critic for the last 10 years. I was elected in uh, 2007, so a little bit over 10 years. And I come from 25 years in healthcare. Um, I would like to start by thanking President Timmons uh, for uh, the warm welcome. I understand we have a special guest, uh, Shane Schwina, who has joined us today. And I would like to uh, express a uh, welcome to him for joining RNAO on their day at Queen's Park. Um, I also like to thank Doris, who uh, and the entire board of director and all of the chapter presidents for your leadership and your advocacy. It is always great to be surrounded by nurses. I just love it. RNAO is such a strong voice for nursing profession. You are a real leader in healthy public policy across Ontario. And I always look forward to your new policy paper. I'm one of those persons that I read them from cover to cover. And uh, I love the topics. I love the breadth that you put in, good, solid research, and uh, always very much on topic. The, um, I also like some of the visit when you do your, uh, take your MPP to work. I have been able to visit all sorts of uh, uh, place of work for RNs and NPs uh, throughout my riding in Sudbury and very much enjoy that. Um, so whether I uh, take a tour with um, the Take Your MPP to Work or, or simply visit our hospital, uh, our hospital is called Health Sciences North and see the work that you do, uh, see the work that many of your colleagues do in often very difficult situation. Uh, this week, I had the opportunity to bring forward uh, a case of uh, a man from my riding who was uh, admitted into the hospital. So you all know that our hospital is sort of our net of last resort. When other pieces of our healthcare system drops off, our hospitals are there and catches us all. But our hospitals are very overcrowded. So he spent his 13 days in the hospital in a bathroom and uh, with his head right next to a toilet. And when the nurse came to care for him, she had to walk sideways and he had to walk sideways because the bed is across one wall and there's barely room on the other side. I think that we all agree that we can do better. And this is where RNA will shine. You share the same values as us. You have the same priorities. And we often share the same vision. I would say everyone who goes into nursing has a pretty big heart. You go into nursing because you want to help people. You want to care. When you see people suffering, you want to help them. It is a profession built on compassion, built on unwavering principle that great care is for the people who need it not for the people who have the ability to pay. This is what Medicare is all about. We offer care based on needs, not on ability to pay. So you can see where nurses and New Democrats have a lot in common. We have a strong bond, and we are together driven to build a better future, one that leaves no one behind. So Ontario has a lot of strength. Our hospital system is world class, in part because of the hard work that you and your colleagues do. We have a community sector that are taking down barriers to access. And we pride ourselves in having good college and university where young people can study hard and become the next generation of RNs. And I've had the opportunity to meet a few of you here today and many more in our university that are looking at the finish line. And this is what makes us great. It is the deep belief 
and the importance of our community and the ideas that we are always better when we work together. So thank you for your compassion and thank you for everything that you give to our province. Despite our strength, we are also facing some challenges. And I would say in some of the papers that you have written, you are taking some of those challenges head on. It is not sufficient to say things need to improve. You have to have a plan as to how are we going to fix it. So when we talk about our aging parents or grandparents or, or ourselves who struggles to get the home care they need or who struggles to get into a long-term care home, you will have heard that we have 78,000 long-term care beds and over 32,000 people on a wait list. I'll let you do the math. It doesn't add up. We, you certainly have heard of people who need a little bit of home care in order to stay home. We have lots of frail elderly people. Aging is not a disease. Aging is a process, a natural process of life. But as you age and get frail, sometimes to be able to stay home in your own home, you need a little bit of help. But when that help doesn't show up, because you can make more money serving coffee at Timmy's than doing your shift in home care, then things go wrong. Those people end up in trouble. They end up in our emergency department. They end up in our hospital. They end up labeled as an ALC. And then we all know where that leaves. You see the impact of the broken pieces of our healthcare system every day in, in your work. And RNAO is very good at bringing forward, put it, putting a spotlight on some of those areas of care that needs to, to be looked at and bringing forward a plan to make things better. I was uh, talking to someone who's interested into mental health. Right here, right now, I represent people who live in Sudbury. If your child need mental health, community mental health, we are looking at it 18 months wait list. Just think about it. You are thinking about a seven or eight or nine year old child who will wait or she will wait for 18 months. What happened during that 18 months? First of all, the family falls apart because they don't know what to do. They've reached out to everybody they could reach out. Their family physician tries, tries to help them. The nurses tries to help them. But the wait list is there. By the time their turn will come up, the child would have been ostracized, bullied at school. The family will have fallen apart. All of this could have been prevented had the child been able to access the right community mental health services when they needed it. So the same thing could be said for the 2.2 million workers in Ontario who don't have a drug plan. When Doris uh, was speaking at the press conference this morning, she made it clear that Canada and Ontario is the only jurisdiction that has Medicare and that does not have a Pharmacare program. What does that mean? That means that one Ontario, Ontarian in four that don't have a drug plan don't take the prescription medicine as prescribed or don't take it at all. That means for hundreds of thousands of people will get in trouble because they don't have the money to pay for the medicine that they, that they need. We need to change this. We need bold changes. And I don't want to sound uh, any more uh, partisan than, <laughs> than needs to be. Uh, but we've seen what the conservatives' idea of change is like. Uh, change that gives tax cuts to the rich doesn't help our society. Change that means more corporate giveaways to the wealthy at companies does not help society. Change that means more privatizations like the sell-off of Hydro One and the out-of-control hydro rate does not help our community. I was uh, 
really proud to see that you have put in uh, your document to us a part about the importance of public asset, the importance of making sure that we don't have a choice as to what hydro company we will purchase, those services should be public and should remain public. So if we look, yeah. So if we start with our hospital, for those of you who work in the hospital sector, you will know that for four years in a row, our hospital-based budget stayed at 0% increase. So during those four years, the Liberal government decided our hospital were going to find savings within. The first year, it sort of worked. They found efficiencies, they introduced the lean program, they did all sorts of changes to hopefully save some money. But for year two, three, and four, we've seen what happened. The number of RNs decreased, the number of overall staff in our hospital went down, entire wings of hospital were closed because they did not have the money to hire the staff to look after them. In year five, which is this year, they got a 1% increase. You've seen what happened to your hydro bills. They went up 300% under the Liberal government. The hospital hydro went up by the same amount. The 1% increase was pretty much eaten up by the hydro bill and the increase in the cost of drugs. What does that mean for paying staff? Increasing the number of staff as the population in Ontario grows, as the population in Ontario age, as the demand for a hospital increase, they were stuck with 0% increase to their budget because the Liberals thought that was the right thing to do. At the NDP, we don't think so. We think that our hospitals should, at a minimum, get the cost of living increase. They should, at a minimum, get the percentage of population increase. And they should, at a minimum, look at the special situation of northern rural and small hospitals because we have seen that they are all in trouble. We've seen our small rural hospital close. We've seen all of our major community hospital stuck with 120, 140. We've hit 147% occupancy. So in, uh, right here in Toronto, in the GTA, a medical unit with 77 beds, sorry, a medical unit with 70 beds had 103 patients admitted. So you can all see in your mind, what does a medical unit with 70 beds and 103 people admitted look like? You all know what it looks like because you've all seen it. It means that people are in corridors. It means that there is no more patient lounge, TV rooms, shower rooms, or anything else. You put beds wherever you can. You make do with what you can. You work to the best of your ability to continue to care for us because this is what nurses do. But it shouldn't be like this province as rich as Ontario with a program that defines us like Medicare should not come to the point where a man named Leo in my writing spends 13 days with his head beside a toilet. It should not be that way. It has to change and I can assure you that under NDP government it would change. It also means that um, nurses that are educated in the southwestern part of our province in Windsor are being hired by hospitals in Detroit. Those are nurses that wanted to work in Ontario, that train in Ontario, that are from Ontario, that are leaving our province. We can't afford to do this. We need to keep you all here. You've talked a bit in your plat in the platform that you've put forward about the roles of RN. 
And I would say the Ministry of Health has talked a great deal about RN prescribing and RN working to their full scope. But as soon as you start to dig in this a little bit, you realize that RN prescribing are for some so few areas of care and some so few areas of practice. If you right off the bat exclude everybody who works in in the hospital sector, and right off the bat, exclude big areas of chronic diseases, then it's all talk, no action, isn't it? RN prescribing, it's something that needs to happen. RN working to their full scope is something that needs to happen. But not just for a few RNs here and there, it needs to happen for the profession as a whole. I always have to be careful of time. No, you're good. I'm good? Yep. You wave me when there's yes, five minutes left? Yes. Because I'm not going through my pages as fast as I'm supposed no, to. that's okay. I'll wave to you. All right. I want to come back to our long-term care system. Remember I told you, 78,000 bed, 32,000 people waiting. The NDP has a bill on the docket right now for four hours of hands-on care. I'm really proud to see that all three parties voted in favor of that bill. Very proud of that. It means that it will happen. But you also have to look at how will it happen. In the, in the bill that I put forward, it is clear what, takes, what you take into account when you calculate four hours of hands-on care. You take the number of staff paid, divide the hours, divide it by the number of beds, and say you have four hours. That means that if you're on maternity leave, if you're sick, if you are on bereavement, if you're on uh, uh, training, if you are being paid but not there, and we count those hours in, how is this going to help the person in the long-term care bed who wants to go to the bathroom? It's not. So when different party talks to you about four hours of hands-on care, dig a little bit to see is this just a big, I mean, we're in a pre-election, is this just a big pre-election announcement? Or is this really something that will come with enough resources behind it to make sure that it actually happens? When we heard, and I was there years ago, when we heard it was Deb Matthew, who was minister at the time, announced 75 nurse practitioners in some of our 760 long-term care home. Well, four years later, we still haven't got 75 nurse practitioners in our long-term care home. And when you really think about it, when you have 78,000 beds, when you have over 760 long-term care home, is 75 the right amount? Can, does anybody in this room think that 75 nurse practitioners can look after 78,000 frail, complex, elderly people? No. Me neither. Me neither. You, you have the right answer, sister. It's not, it's not going to happen. So here again, we need more RNs in our long-term care. We need more NPs in our long-term care. But we need those promises to come with the resources to make sense on the ground. The 75 were supposed to be something that grows. It has been four years and we still haven't even got 75. What kind of a promise is that? It looked good that day, everybody clapped in the room. Yay, I was there. I clapped also, I thought it was a good idea. Four years later, I'd like to unclap, but I'm not too sure how you do that. <laughs> so, four years ago, we were also coming close to going into an election, so that may have a bit to do with this. Now, I want to talk to you a, a little bit about uh, mental health. So, in September this year, I introduced a bill called Mental Health and Addiction. I want to create a ministry of mental health and addiction. Don't get me wrong, a ministry is not what provides care. But what a ministry will do 
is it will give mental health and addiction a home. It will make somebody responsible to make sure that the best practice that exists in mental health and addiction right now in our province are, are identified, that a basket of minimum services that should be available to all equally throughout the province is actually rolled out. That rather than having 11 different ministry, some of them coming to us when we were in the Select Committee for Mental Health and Addiction and telling us, we know that we're not doing a good job. This is not our mandate, but you know, we have those mental health services that we have to provide. This is no way. I would say we are at a cusp where people, Ontarians, are finally okay to deal with the stigma. They are coming out and say, I need mental health care. I need help with my mental health. This is a huge step because those of you who worked in that sector will know that for a long time it was really hard for Ontarians to reach out. So now we have more Ontarians reaching out, which is great. There is no health without mental health. But when they reach out, they get added to that list of 18 months for children mental health in Sudbury. They get added to that list that are not in days or weeks or months, but years long to be able to access services. And now we have this looming uh, threat of who will be able to provide psychotherapy and who won't be able to provide psychotherapy looming <laughs> on top of that. The Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction will be there to bring leadership, to give it a home, to make sure that we go through those challenges, overcome this, and build a strong and robust mental health and addiction system that we can all be proud of. That the statistics from last year that a thousand people died in Toronto alone of overdose from opioid, this should never happen. Let's call it the way it is. It is a public health emergency. Why don't we call it a public health emergency so that we can draw the resources that are needed to deal with it, rather than having... Rather than having some, some good people with, with good skill and good heart working at it from the corner of their desk because they have 49 other priorities they have to deal with, by calling a public health emergency, it becomes the priority. You clear your desk, you work at it till you're able to make a significant difference. We know that we can beat this. We know that we have to beat this. Let's give it the resources, the attention, the priority needed so we don't go through another year of thousands of life lost that could have all been prevented. This is a shame on all of us. We can do better for our neighbors. We have to do better. We have to tackle this. That brings me to PharmaCare. So, in uh, spring last year, my leader, Andrea Horvath, announced that uh, one of the big plank of the NDP platform will be to bring PharmaCare. PharmaCare for everyone. So right now... <laughs> so right now in Ontario, we have seven different drug programs. The latest one being OHIP Plus, for youth 25 and under. I have nothing against the program that exists. They do good work, they help a lot of people. But we have to do better than this. Of the hundreds of countries that have Medicare, we have to change. We have to bring PharmaCare. The federal government talks about it, but really hasn't really put it forward. So what we have put forward is a solution that exists into over 130 other countries, is a list of essential medicine. We have tested it. 
but I can guarantee you it's not going to be politicians who makes the, de the decision as to what drugs go on that list. But we have tested three different lists just to see. So for about $475 million at the max, that is if we are not able to negotiate better prices and if we take the most expensive list of the one that have been tested, we can offer prescription drugs that covers 90% of the drugs that are covered in primary care. Once you covered 90% of the drugs that are covered in primary care, you start to have a pretty big impact as those, dr so that's 125 drugs. As economies of scale starts to roll out, it gives you the opportunity to increase the formulary, to go from 125 to 150, to look at all the cancer drugs and all the new biologic and all of the new drugs that can be added. But it's a way to get it started to say, well, from the get-go, we will cover 4,400 drugs for everyone, is a reason to do nothing, because this would be too expensive off the bat. But if you roll it in, like many other countries have done, and usually when people spend, stand there, there's a message in there for me. So I will, we need PharmaCare. If the federal government is not going to go ahead, an NDP government will go ahead. We will bring it to Ontario, pretty much like Tommy Douglas did with Medicare in Saskatchewan, and then it will be rolled out, hopefully, uh, countrywide, and then we can increase the formulary to bring more and more drugs. But to do nothing because to do it all is too big is not an option. Let's bring something forward that will help 90% of the people Let's get it started. It will make a huge difference. I had a few other things I wanted to say, but hopefully it'll be covered in question. It is always a pleasure to be here with you. If we can be helpful or useful, it will be our pleasure to work with you. It's always good to be surrounded uh, by the membership and uh, executive of RNAO. Merci beaucoup. <laughs>